Okay, looks like it's working. So let's get started. We are a bit behind today, but I think today's materials are relatively, I would say short. So hopefully not a problem. I'm going to first share, oh my gosh, I have to like install like everything. <laughs> okay, there we go. Okay, so the screen's shared. And I'm going to also share you the link for today's lecture slides. So here it is. Go ahead and download. Okay, so let's get lecture nine started. I'm sorry for starting it late. For those of you who came late, yeah, I had some technical difficulties with uh, my new computer's Zoom. All right, so let's begin with the quiz. So I'm going to launch the quiz. It's quiz zero nine. Question one, true or false. Question two. Oh, shoot. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Question three. True or false. All right. So. Oh, wait. Okay, so you have three minutes. You have three minutes.
Okay, so I'm, I'll leave it open, but let's begin with the recap of lecture eight. Before that, I will have to make a few announcements. So as you know, as always, please put your student ID and name on your Zoom profile. It's for your attendance. And uh, I think I told you your attendance will be um, taken through your quiz submission. Although your quiz submissions, uh, the uh, actual score will not be accounted. And assignment one is due, actually was due last Wednesday and you were allowed to use up to seven late penalty days. So I think some of you might be um, submitting today, but please note that it will be, it will receive a grade of zero if you submit after 11 p.m. today. So please submit something at least. And also assignment one solutions and rubric will be released next Wednesday. And all your grades will be released one week after. There will be no lecture on next Monday. Hopefully everyone knows. It's, uh, yeah, it's another Korean holiday. And maybe you have already checked out the schedule, but the final project details are out on the uh, website. So please check it out. And um, please complete the survey by next Wednesday. So the survey is very short. It just asks you what you wanna do, option one or two. I think we, uh, we discussed last week that the option one will be doing your own final project. And option two is working on open domain question answering. So please make sure to submit the survey by next Wednesday. And assignment two will be released tomorrow. So I'm sorry for the delay. It was actually supposed to be released today, but um, it's, it, it got a bit delayed. Okay, so I think should be okay with the all the chats. All right. Okay, let's start with the recap, lecture A recap. So last lecture we we talked about dense retrieval and we saw what's difference, what what are the differences between dense vectors and sparse vectors. So dense vectors are good for good for capturing syntactic and semantic um, information. But they're also, also sometimes not so precise about lexical information. This is because dense vectors, they will think that, for instance, word Einstein and word Tesla should be similar because they're both scientists. Whereas, of course, sometimes we want to explicitly distinguish between them. And sparse vectors are actually good at, relatively good at those exactly matching words, but then they're actually not as good for the uh, syntactic or semantic information. And so that this is why in practice, actually for many applications, dense vectors and sparse vectors are um, used at the same time for most, I would say modern, modern um, good search engines. And we also discussed that the um, in order to search for the, the best, the most similar vector, we call this process uh, nearest neighbor search. And um, basically in nearest neighbor search, one of the most important thing is how you define the neighbor or the nearness, because it's basically finding that what your nearest neighbor is, then your definition of nearness is really important, right? And there are largely uh, four kinds of uh, measures that people use a lot. So L1 and L2 are, I think, very well known. L2 is basically the, really the distance that we talk about, the canonical definition of distance, the real distance, right? And L1 is also called Manhattan distance because, you know, in Manhattan, you have all these perpendicular roads, and then if you want to go from here to here, distance is not the 
L to real distance, but you should actually um, think of the, uh, you know, horizontal and vertical distance summed. That's actually uh, real uh, your distance that you actually have to travel to get there. Inner product is MIPS, also called MIPS because um, MIPS is uh, shorthand for maximum inner product search, and actually. So I, I, I was not really super accurate about this. It's not that inner product is equal to MIPS. It's not correct way to say it. Well, it's not AKA, but um, so I was just say that um, you use MIPS to indicate that this is a search, but then of course inner product is just a, um, you know, a vector, a vector operation between two vectors, right? So I hope that you notice the difference between those two terms. But when you see MIPS, think of inner product. And inner product simply is when you have two vectors, you basically multiply element wise and then, then sum. In this case, this will be zero. And cosine distance actually is very related to cosine similarity. And the cosine similarity is uh, just doing inner product after normalization. So it will be basically one minus cosine similarity. And um, cosine similarity is if you have a two vectors, then it's just uh, you basically do um, x inner product y divided by x y norms. So note that these three are distance metric because they're the smaller, they're better, and they are zero if they're equal, two vectors are equal, whereas the inner product is not a distance metric, it's just a similarity metric. And this is, this is the, the opposite that it's, it's larger, the better. But okay, there, there is actually a question from Min Jung that those who are not willing to do, do a final project should participate in the poll. Okay, actually my bad. So I'm gonna actually change the poll right now. Um, so I think I did not include the option to say you're uh, not doing final project. That's really a good point. So in case you have already submitted, um, and it looks like at least there, there is only one submission. So that's a good thing. And um, uh, Wait, no, it's not this, sorry. I'll change it right now. So there are three submissions. Okay, so I'm gonna say there are three options, right? Option three is, um, I will, uh, you're doing assignments only. And in that case, in that in that uh, case, then you don't have to actually fill out anything other than that. So I just actually released it. So please um, see if it's updated. But please, uh, so basically, please uh, fill out the form, even if you're not doing final project, because I, I want to know if you're not doing final project. But um, if you actually choose option three, then um, you might, you're, you might change your mind later, right? So um, think of it carefully. So even if you choose option one, you can actually choose to go back to option three. So, I mean, you can also do the other way too, but, um, but then, you know, the, the, the reason why we're doing it is because I want to actually approve whether your project is a valid topic beforehand. And um, if you actually just like, you know, decide to do option one, um, then I cannot really, you know, just confirm that like a day before the submission deadline, right? So that's why I'm doing this. So um, please uh, make a decision pretty soon. Okay. All right. Coming back to the recap. All right, so we talk about inverted index, which is, um, um, use for sparse vectors where you can actually make the search really fast. 
by just storing the um, the target vectors that are corresponding to certain keys. In sparse vectors, that that those keys were actually the whether each word is contained in each document, but that doesn't work for dense vectors, right? Because dense vectors um, actually don't 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 have a you know separate dimensions for uh, different words. So that's why we have to do clustering, and the clustering allows us to basically assign these keys to different documents. And once we have assigned the keys, then basically we have a uh, you know uh, each key only uh, you know corresponds to only a few documents. That and in that way, when a question comes in, we identify a few possible keys that the question can map to, then we just, you know, search in those keys. In that sense, you can think of this, um, you know, clustering methods in den for dense vectors, very similar to inverted index in the, um, in the sparse vectors using the word, whether word exists in do each document. But the, you will basically get to know these things a bit, uh, a lot better as you do your assignment. But, uh, so the point is that you will have to make this kind of inverted index for dense vectors for really large search space because you cannot just you know search through like trillions billions of vectors it will take a lot of time it's very inefficient so you want to actually create these um, clusters I mean these keys and uh, I said clusters because that's one of the most popular methods for creating these keys but um, I think we discussed last class that there are several ways so one is um, not just the clustering, but also we can use something called locality sensitive hashing, but these two are both based on creating buckets. So this is corresponding to keys. And then we basically just put nearby points into these buckets. And we also talk about another possible idea, which is we can create a proximity graph and then try to tra traverse the graph to find the closest point. And in this case, um, the HNSW is one of a proximity graph method. And if you're interested, actually, it's good to actually, you know, really delve into this method because it's one of the most accurate approximation and also pretty fast, very fast. Um, but then the disadvantage is that it takes a lot of space because you have to build a graph. So there are really good NNS libraries. And um, what I wanted to say here was that um, do not reinvent the wheel. You probably, uh, if you're building an application, then probably at least as far as the nearest neighbor search is concerned, then probably you can, uh, you're, there, are a there is a library that probably fits your needs. So um, in, the, in the assignment, you will be using Vice. You might also consider using Annoy, which is made by Spotify. And Scikit-learn nearest neighbors is not bad, but um, Typically, it's not uh, industry grade, which means it's not super scale friendly. You cannot probably handle a lot of uh, like billions of points with Scikit-learn. And final project, yeah, option three, of course. Thank you for pointing this out. Assignments only. And again, um, option one is your own project, but then you will have to describe what your project is about. And I'll actually let you know if your project looks like a um, you know, bad topic. It has to be related to NLP. Open domain QA, you have a bit of a, you already have a bit of a, you know, baselines and what you should do on the, um, the handout that I posted on the schedule. But some of you, some of the materials will not you will not be able to understand yet because we haven't covered it, but don't worry about it. And I told you that final project will be about question answering and we actually covered question answering a bit. I'll probably go really, um, actually, uh, there's nothing much to talk about. I think we, we you remember that we talked about question answering last class and question answering is really about, um, you know, finding the answer from a large set of corpus given a question. And you want to basically work on how we can improve this baseline. But improvement, of course, can be made in different aspects, not just accuracy, but also speed and maybe minimizing memory footprint, et cetera. And I, we did a, a quick FICE tutorial to see how FICE works code-wise. 
All right, so finally we're in the uh, quiz nine answers. Okay, so I'm going to um, close the quiz. And I'm going to save it first. So I don't lose it. No? All right, let's see how you did. All right, so question number one, true or false? Similarly to L1 and L2 distance, inner product can be considered as distance uh, where small value means the two vectors are close to each other. And this is false, right? Because L1 and L2 distances the, if two vectors are exactly same, their values will be zero. But inner product, if two values are uh, same, then their values will be bigger than when they are not actually close to each other or similar. But of course, you cannot always say that's also true because, because it's inner product. It's also possible that you, know, you have exactly two same vectors. So, and then their inner product can be smaller than or worse than two widely different vectors that have really large magnitude. So suppose, uh, for instance, inner product is sometimes actually we use this, um, this arrow. So this can be actually much smaller than um, you have another vector y. y is not equal to x. So there is x and y such that um, x and x inner product is much smaller than x of x comma y. And this is actually sometimes at least theoretically very problematic. And it's actually why we say inner product is unbounded or it's very not, I would say, um, it's, it's not um, conceptually distance metric because in, the, in order to, in order for a measure to, in order a uh, function or kernel, we usually call these like, uh, when, when a function have two inputs and we're comparing between them, we usually call that function or a kernel. When a kernel has, whether a kernel is a metric or not, um, is conceptually very dependent on this kind of concept. The fact that um, the distance between exactly same vectors should be zero and nothing else should be uh, you know, more similar to than the vector, which makes sense, right? I mean, how can you be more similar to yourself than yourself? But inner product will be actually, that's actually possible because inner product is not distance measure. So that's really important to know because uh, that means that if y's magnitude is super high, then it can actually be much higher than x comma x inner product. And actually it's also word, worth noting that there is actually quite interesting relationship between L2 and inner product because L2 of X and Y is, I think I, I, we talked about this before. Um, it's actually, X minus Y transpose X minus Y. And this is just X transpose X plus y transpose y minus 2x transpose y. And if you actually do this uh, in a more elegant way, then what this means is that you do negative and you do negative two and then open bracket and x transpose y minus x transpose x or x transpose x is just the um, magnitude of x, right? Right, to the y divided by two. So basically just the, the middle point between x and y or the average of these two vectors. And of course, when you're doing some maximum or minimum in, uh, inner product search, then this is not really important, right? Because well, who cares? Of course, minus is important because it gives you the direction, but what matters is here. So you see that the L2 distance is just uh, inner product 
penalized by the average of the magnitude of two inputs, which is, you know, which means that this value would be really high, even if Y is, um, you know, even if the inner product is very big, if one of the magnitudes is really high, then this value will be penalized. And if you actually uh, make this uh, go a bit further, then you can, when, when you fix X, then when you're looking for Y that gives you best distance, you can actually also um, uh, notice that this value is not really needed. It's just like you don't need the, uh, the scale at the front. So basically this is, so it's, uh, in other words, um, argument of uh, Y of L2 distance, well, L2 usually is actually, you know, we usually do this, right? This is actually equivalent to, not approximately equivalent, but exactly equivalent to X transpose Y minus just Y over two. Because you can just ignore this X when you're trying to, that's just constant, right? If you just fix X and trying to find the, the closest Y. So it's, a, it's actually good intuition to have when you're actually comparing between our product and L2 distance mathematically. But anyways, I took too much time on the, uh, the troll false. Okay, so it's false. And number two, consider the inner product of the following two vectors, uh, one 0 0.2, four 0 0.7, and three 0, 0 0.5 and 10. And what is the inner products, right? Um, so it's very simple. You basically do element-wise multiplication. So what is element-wise multiplication? Element-wise multiplication is um, one times three, which is three, 0.2 times zero is zero, and four times 0.5 is two, and seven, 0 0.7 times 10 is just seven, right? And you just do the summation. Um, so inner product will be what? Three plus two plus seven, which is, Oh. And lastly, um, true or false, approximate nearest neighbor search allows one to control the trade-off between search accuracy and memory usage. Well, actually the approximate nearest neighbor search will actually um, have a lower search accuracy than exact nearest neighbor search, but it will also have a higher memory usage. So it's not a trade-off actually. Um, so what the correct actually word here is not memory usage, but um, speed. So approximate nearest neighbor search usually don't have a speed up. They sometimes have, I mean, not, not speed up, I'm saying. They usually don't have memory usage, better memory usage or lower memory usage. But sometimes they do when they're doing um, scalar quantization, for instance, but not always. So it's not really about saving memory. It's about making it faster. Okay, so looks like actually number three was pretty difficult for I think many of you, right? More people got it wrong than correct. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing this. Um, so we, I spent a lot of time doing um, recap and quiz, um, but lecture nine, I'm going to just tell you what we're gonna talk about today for the rest of the lecture after of course, <laughs> Um, five minute break. So up to now, then we have covered text classification. Okay, there's actually a really good question. So isn't normal square? That's right, actually, so, sorry, my bad. So you're right. It's actually should be this, yeah. But I just like ignored it because, you know, square root is also monotonically increasing function. So you can just ignore that too. Yeah, you're right though. So, but then st still this holds true. Do you agree? Still this holds true. Oh yeah, yeah that's right. Okay. <laughs> that's actually, that's, that's, that's actually your really good point. Sorry about that. Um, so this is actually, yeah, square, scale of norm. Sorry about that.
So yeah, um, I screwed up in two places, right? Um, I missed square root and also I missed square. Thanks for pointing out. Okay, so, um, so today's lecture will be about text generation, which actually involves several tasks, including machine translation. And this, of course, um, cannot be handled with the previous models, just like uh, RNN. So we will introduce the uh, idea of an encoder decoder and we'll see how it works. And that will lead to actually motivation of attention mechanism next lecture. So see you in five minutes at um, um, 45.
All right, welcome back. So let's get started with the text generation. All right, so why do we need text generation? So let's consider um, relatively, I guess, um, well-known task, which is called summarization, which we do all the time, which we have been doing, um, you know, when you were in high school, I think one of um, important assignments, I think, is about really uh, something about summarization, right? Because when you read some book and then you have to summarize it and then talk about your feelings, of course, the talking about your feelings are, is one thing, but um, you have to first summarize the, the entire book. It's a very long book and you have to summarize it. So it's a very difficult task, right? And um, we, probably it's too difficult that we can actually, you know, try to create a, a bit more controlled environments like uh, summarizing news article, which is now maybe a uh, thousands of words to a few tens of words. So if, if we want to um, summarize this text, then you have to actually, ha you have a text as input, just like other tasks, other formulations, but now you have a text as output, not a label or not a token position. And of course, there are actually a few ways to make this um, token classification. And that's actually called um, extractive summarization that you actually make sure that your summary is only made up of words, phrases, or sentences from the original. So basically what you're doing is that as you read, I mean, as the model, model reads the summary, the model has to decide whether each token, each uh, phrase or each sentence will belong to the su final summary or not. So in that, in that sense, then you can think of this as either a text or token classification problem. Well, that's actually very reliable in many cases. And that's actually why um, a lot of a summarization models in uh, industry uses sentence classification model and that sentence classification model decides whether that sentence will be included or not in the final summary. But uh, that's it. After you define, decide, after your model decides whether the sentence is included, then it's simply, you know, um, just just make your summary out of those included sentences. And token classification is a bit more tricky because you have to actually decide the uh, whether a token is included wait i think i was okay is the signal unstable okay hopefully it's fine now but please let me know if i'm unstable again actually that's one reason why actually um i uh you know turned the video off Internet is not too good here. Okay, thanks. All right, so token classification is also quite similar, except that you're now to classify. Uh, uh, yeah, sure, I'll actually start from the beginning. Okay. Okay, so um, what I wanted to say here is that, well, how uh, maybe you can also, you can choose to summarize a, a document, a news article by deciding or making your model to decide whether each sentence, each phrase or each word will be included in the final summary. And this is very convenient in many cases because <clears throat> that you can use the same token classification or text class classification models that you, you, you know how to create from the previous lectures. And then just use the results of the, these models for your um, final summary, which is very convenient, right? But, um, and text classification is very, I think, very popular, especially since the early days of uh, these new summarizations that um, they are used to summarize a news article by just choosing which sentence is important in the article. And token classification, of course, is a bit more um, tricky because 
Now you have to think about the syntax too. If you just choose which sentence to put, then at least you don't have to worry about the syntax. You just have to worry about the flow. Um, but then if you actually decide to decide which tokens, then if you choose the wrong tokens, then your sentence will be really bad, right? If you just choose a, you know, tokens without a verb, you, can, you might choose tokens without subject. So it becomes a bit more tricky, but still, um, you know, it's, it's relatively more controllable than generation-based or which people call abstractive summarization, where now you're not formulating this into a text or token classification problem, but now your summary might be entirely paraphrased, uh, which means it has to be generated. And actually you might be more familiar with abstractive summarization in your, I think, high school or middle school classes, because I'm pretty sure that your teachers didn't like you just copying and pasting whatever you see on the book, right? So you have been doing abstractive summarization. You're, you're, you're already uh, paraphrasing things. It's just that machines, at least uh, until like 2014, we didn't have a good idea how we can do this. So actually probably not even 2014, but like I think 2015, 16, it was very bad. Um, but then anyways, I, I think the difference between extractive and abstractive summarization is clear, hopefully. So that's why that's one, one case that we need text generation. And machine translation is even more challenging than summarization in many cases. I'll not say actually this task is more challenging these days because I think MT works better than um, most um, abstractive summarization. And because MT is well-defined relative to summarization, the summarization can be, you know, they can result in different summaries depending on what the authors think is important. But MT is at least not suffering from that kind of problem much. But I think MT, the, the problem of machine translation is pretty clear. Your input is, um, for instance, English sentence, and your output should be a Korean sentence. And it's pretty clear that you cannot just, you know, choose which word you include in your output because now your output is like entirely a new language. So um, now you might wonder, so then what is the, 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 the crucial difference between text classification um, and text generation? So one of the really key difference in terms of uh, the difficulty is that um, the key difference is that um, text classification, you can just use MLE. Remember this, what this stands for? This stands for the uh, maximum likelihood, maximum likelihood estimation. And what that means is that you turn your problem into probabilistic distribution. You, you basically consider your function to be a probabilistic distribution, which means it, uh, the output of the, your, your model or our function is the probability distribution of whether your um, certain output is correct or not. That way you can actually you know, make this entire model differentiable. And then you just use cross entropy on top of it to make it work. And in fact, although there may be a few variations in the literature, you can basically just expect that this works the best in most cases. And um, of course, there are a few small modifications such as annealing, sometimes soft labels, uh, distillations, semi supervision et cetera. But the, the core is very similar. But then in text generation, there is a very critical problem. What is that? The fact that the probability space of text is very large, that you cannot really use MLE. Why? Because MLE can be only used if you can actually exactly define your output distribution. And in text classification, your output space is, if you're doing binary classification, only two. If you're doing like a, you know five class classification, then it's five. But then if you're generating text, then you're talking about 
given this vocab size of v, you're talking about in the order of uh, v to the power of t. And how large is this number? Well, we know that t will be usually um, at least you know 10, and sometimes it can be longer than like uh, 30. So this is at least 10. And v is here, unless you're doing character level um, things, even if you use subword, it will be at least as big as 10K. And it's not 10K times 10, it's 10K to the power of 10. And this is basically equivalent to 10 to the power of uh, 40. And that's, it's just for a length of a 10. And that's really large number that I think, um, you know, you have um, 40 zeros, right? So the point is that you cannot define the um, output space or the probability space of the output text. Although we cannot say it's infinite because if we have fixed the maximum length, which is I think in practice, good thing to do, as I've told you in the classification too, these days, especially, then uh, it's, it's finite, but very large. So what we do it, uh, often is actually we define MLE via uh, multiplication of conditional independent, uh, not independent, but conditional probabilities. So we, we basically use Bayes rule. So what is that? So we're saying that if you want to define P of Y given X, this was not bad for classification because the cardinality of uh, the output is only like two, four, et cetera. But then here, the cardinality of output will be like, you know, 10 to the power of 40, super large, the entire output space. So that's why we cannot really model this probability distribution. So what, instead, what we do is that we model this as a conditional probability of a consecutive words. So you first measure given X, what is the probability of the first word? And then you measure Give, uh, give it X and the first word, what is the probability of uh, Y2? And you basically continue doing that until the last token, YT given X and Y1 to T minus one. So then um, for number one, so question number one, are they equivalent? Are, am I making any approximation or are they equivalent? So here, it's a very actually um, tricky question. And the answer is that, yeah, they're equivalent because, um, you know, bias rule is actually about equivalence, not um, approximation or anything. So actually these, this will be exactly equal to P of Y given X. Why? Because if you'd compute first this, this will be by bias rule, then this will be Y1, Y2 given X. And if you compute this, then it will be P of Y1, Y2, y3 given x and you can do uh, so and so until basically you do uh, the last multiplication which becomes just y1 to yt given x which is just p of y given x right any question and this is more convenient because now each probability distribution is relatively small how large is that? Well, because y1 is just single word. So this the, 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 the cardinality of this y1 space is just um, the size of vocab, right? And actually the same for the every following probability distributions. All right, so let's consider cases where um, uh, the output length is fixed to one then we can safely say that p of y given x is just equal to p of y one given x right and you will see that this is basically a v-way classification so here text generation is equivalent to classification and in that case then i think a simple approach will be just to use the last hidden state of lstm that we use for token classification and the text classification for your classification, right? So what does that mean? So suppose that you have a x1, x2, x3, then we basically just use this hidden state 
and then you know this will be just in some embedding and then we just use some um, classification into v and then just make this into probably by softmax and then just compare this with the um, cross entropy of the true label simple right but what if um, t equal two? So then we can say that the first conditional probability will be identical, but how about the second conditional probability? It becomes a bit different. Okay, wait. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, you're right. Good point. This should be, Y1 comma Y2. It looks like, yeah, someone's paying a lot of attention to this. So it's a good thing. Thanks for pointing out. Okay, so um, how about the second conditional probability, this one? Well, we need to make uh, some generic way to actually work for t bigger than one because now we have to think about how we can do this, right? So um, in general, well, I mean, not in general, but then traditionally, when people were trying to do text generation, um, specifically the machine translation, which was well-defined and had, has of course, apparently huge industry applications. So a lot of people were interested in this problem. Uh, what people were trying to do is that they actually tried to um, create machine translation system through basically alignment. And we call this actually a statistical machine translation. And in fact, the, even the statistical machine translation is very similar how it's, uh, you know, how it's probably is um, structured inside. It's very similar to what I just said. They basically break down the big, um, big variable y into several different variables and make this into a multiplication of different um, consecutive, consecutive conditional probabilities. But then point here is that you define each probability not using the deep learning model, but then back then until like 2015-ish, uh, people were actually using this alignment information for the training data and then basically using that to actually create the output. So here the input is um, Chinese. And then we know that the uh, each word, this is, uh, you know, we, right, woman. Um, so woman is a we, and then we have like, a, you know, great. Uh, this have a two alignments. Well, I have to use the uh, two alignment and then one alignment, one, 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 right. So we find the, uh, in this statistical machine translation, we find the alignments first and then try to guess the, what the output will be. Of course, I'm not gonna go into details of SMT, but then it's good to know that they used a lot of uh, um, strong supervision. The fact that which phrase has just to map to which phrase, basically they have that training data. And then they also use the full, um, the input output pair data to create these machines. And these were super complicated, like super complex. They are like uh, you know, tons of codes go into this. No one understands how exactly each thing works. And it was apparent that um, since this was developed in I think 1980s, we can call uh, like late 1980s, we're getting more complex and more complex. Maybe if I have time later, I'll talk about this um, history, but then that later now the, the model becomes really slow, really complex. and you know, it becomes like a huge thing. Um, even like a, one company might be dedicated to this because of the uh, such a large code base. And then now there came, um, you know, around 2012, there was a rush of deep learning in image domain. Uh, we didn't see a lot of, um, I would say, advancements in NLP back then in 2012, but then basically 2014, there came this paper, paper which was basically just like, a, you know, basically just um, was a super big surprise. It was a, uh, I would say like paradigm shift, which is 
can we actually use deep learning to do machine translation? And it's actually very ironic how the title looks like because they actually said it's statistical machine translation, right? And then now we say, um, you know, SMT versus neural MT or NMT. And NMT, the original NMT is this paper. So um, it's kind of, you know, ironic that um, the origin of NMT actually calls in its title that itself is statistical machine translation. Although this is not a wrong way to say it because um, you know, neural networks, machine learning uh, are all actually statistically uh, driven. But so, and in fact, how it does this is very, um, you know, very similar to how we motivated you would approach this problem if we have, uh, you know, this t equal one, t equal two cases. Although of course um, that's more apparent now because this was invented. So I'm not undervaluing the uh, invention. I'm just saying that um, actually it becomes very clear after you read the paper. And I think those are really, really uh, the good inventions, right? Um, it becomes obvious after you re read it. It's like, oh, why, why, could, why, why didn't I think of this? But then I think usually those are intuitive, very persuasive um, and very in, uh, influential inventions. But anyways, so it's um, it's very familiar with what we discussed, right? Basically, we have an what we have what we have uh, here is uh, that we first have x inputs, right? And we have LSTM or something uh, RNNs, and we basically have this last hidden state here. We call it C. Uh, it's basically same as H. Uh, it's different symbols. So and then. If we were actually when when we're when the t equal to one, then we basically used c directly for predicting the first word y one, right? But now, this what this model does is basically how it general it generalizes this into t bigger than one. So what it does is that now we have encoded this vector. And then this vector gets um, fed into another RNN, which basically outputs the uh, uh, first word. Of course, this is a vector and it has to be classified into V way for the word prediction. And then to make it work for T bigger than one, now we construct a RNN that's operating in the output space. And that's why we call this part decoder because it's not actually operating in the input space time axis, but it's operating in the output space time axis. And we just do the same thing for the RNN. But then now you might wonder is then what is the input to this RNN? Well, so there are actually these dotted lines are not input to the RNNs. They're actually um, just, um, well, I mean, they're inputs, but then the uh, they're just actually, you can think of that as more of an additional input, but what actually gets into these RNNs is the, the previous word, the output of the, the RNNs, the previous output. So here, basically, the, at first you have to put uh, something, some special token, for instance, called start, and then you, you, out, you emit it the Y1, and Y1 goes here, and then, Y1 is used as the input for the second RNN, second time step. And then you get Y2, and then this goes into uh, input. And that's actually drawn with this arrow. So it's a bit confusing. This is a diagram from the original paper, but um, that's what this means actually. And this dotted lines is just that when they're predicting that um, vector, they just actually, not only they use the, the obvious solid line, but they also use this dotted lines, they concatenate that and then predict it. So uh, um, mathematically, what that means is, um, for instance, Y1 is you use the RNN, single step RNN, and then basically it, your RNN has a previous hidden state and current input. Here, the previous hidden state, what will be? That's actually just C because that's basically the uh, um, 
Well, actually, I'm not, I, I don't exactly recall how actually construct this. Probably maybe they actually use zero vector. And then uh, when they're putting um, the um, input, they actually concatenate the um, start embedding and um, the C. And similarly, Y2 is RNN and they have now the hidden state from time step one, but they still have the um, same structure where you concatenate the uh, Y1 and the C. So, so but um, of course the C can go here to the hidden state. So I'll actually get come back to this after I actually take a look at the paper. I'm not sure how they did this in the original paper, but you get the point that um, you just basically use RNN to unwrap your output. And they, that's why they call it decoder. And they have decoders, so now they have encoder, right? Encoder is the, uh, in, they actually um, summarize the input into one vector because we are assuming that this vector C has everything you need. We are, we are hoping that this C has the, all the information from the input. Okay, actually I had this, right? Apparently. Yeah, but uh, it's basically the same function, right? So, so um, here in this case, um, ht minus one, h uh, zero will be just um, zero vector. And yt minus one is the previous, um, uh, previous output. And this will be, y zero will be just start tokens embedding. And c is the, uh, the it's coming into the, um, you know, every RNN's input. And that's exactly why now it's time to define F. And of course we can use LSTM, we can use RNN for F, but then um, the paper actually introduces a new recurrent unit called GRU. And here you will see that the, um, this is very similar to LSTM. We have uh, this gates, right? These are a sigmoid. This is sigmoid. And we have this um, HT, which is just um, you know, 10H of um, the, um, you're using input, but there's one important difference, which is that you actually gate with uh, this RT into this previous hidden state, and then you do the same thing with the bias. And then also you have a second gate, which is very interesting because now you have this um, HT minus one, gated with one minus, ZT, uh, one minus ZT, and your current hidden state candidate is element wise multiplied with the ZT. Okay, there was a actually suggestion, isn't the second line you wrote in the previous slide, isn't Y2? Hmm. Is it this one? Okay, yeah, yeah, sorry. This is Y2, yeah. Thanks, thanks for pointing out. Okay, so then what is really the characteristic of this kind of gating mechanism? Well, that means that if ZT is high, then you are actually using the, um, the H hat, but then you're forcing to not to use the previous hidden state because if ZT is close to one, then this gate value will be close to zero then you will, not, you will actually nullify the previous hidden state. So this is really the gate, right? Basically it's a switch between um, two inputs. You're actually deciding which input to use, either uh, the H hat or HT minus one, but not both with the full scale. Of course, this is soft. So you cannot, you can use both with 0.5 of 0.5 weight, but you cannot do 1.0 for both. And that's critical difference from the uh, LSTM in terms of, uh, how, what, what kind of role the gate does. Here, you're actually controlling. You're actually kind of using kind of more of a, um, I would say XOR, right? Because you, um, you actually allow either A to pass or B to pass, but you don't allow both to pass. So it's either one, one comma zero or zero comma one, but you cannot be one comma one or you cannot be one, zero comma zero. So it's kind of, the, this kind of gating mechanism is very similar to I'll say X O R. Okay. Actually, so 
I'm gonna probably stop here because um, I think we'll not finish in time anyways if we go into this and um, attention mechanism actually will be talking will be very related to what I what I'm gonna talk about in the next two slides. So okay, so um, uh, this is it for today's lecture. I will see you next Wednesday because there is no lecture on Monday. And again, assignment one is strict, strictly due today. So please make sure to submit something and you will get grade in two weeks. And I'll upload assignment two. I'll try to upload that by tomorrow, but uh, don't worry about the um, deadline. I'll try, I'll give you two weeks from the, the date I upload the, um, the assignment. Okay. All right. So thanks. Thank, thank you everyone. See you next Wednesday. Enjoy your another long weekend.